We see that more people are joining, so we're just giving everyone just a moment. All right, good morning and welcome. This is our first meeting in 2024. Uh, we are ad, um, adjourning our, our, starting our January 19, 2024 Middle Mile Advisory Committee meeting. And our first order of business is roll call. Ms. Alvarado, will you please call roll and uh, go over the housekeeping items? Thank you. Housekeeping rules statement. Attendees, please note there is time allocated at the end of the meeting for public comment, either in person, via Zoom, phone, or email. Presenters, please cue Sam to advance these slides. Committee members, please raise your hands to speak, and ex officio, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom to cue Director Bailey Crimmins to call you to speak. Now, committee member roll call, State CIO and Director Bailey Crimmins. Here. President Reynolds? Here. Chief Deputy Director Miller? Here. Director Tavares? Michael Kiever for Director Tavares. Secretary Tong? Here. Senator Gonzalez? Senator McGuire? Assemblymember Berner? Assemblymember Wood? Here. Supervisor Alejo? Present. Supervisor Starkey? I am here. Director Bailey Crimmins, we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Alvarado. Uh, for, first of all, thank you for everyone that's attending today's meeting. Um, you're going to hear from the Department of Technology, Caltrans, uh, a special guest, CTC Technology and Energy, our third-party administrator, Golden State Net, uh, our also partner, CPUC, on their progress towards meeting the governor's and the legislature, letter, legislature's goal of broadband for all. We have an information-rich uh, agenda today, and so we expect to stay within time, but for some reason, we hit the two-hour mark. I will call for a, um, a short uh, recess, and so just making sure that everyone's aware of that. So are there any committee members that would like to provide comments before we get up, um, you know, started with the updates? We'll start in the room. I see none virtually. Are there any? Alicia? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the first agenda item number two is the executive report out from Mr. Mark Monroe. Good morning, Chair and members. Uh, uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to provide an update uh, for you this morning on the MMBI project. As the chair noted, we have a, a dense agenda uh, this morning um, that, that we'll try to, to go through at pace. CDT and its partners have been very busy over the last three months and since, since we last met in, in October, and uh, we'll be providing a number of updates today. Uh, the MMBI project is, is really headed into the new season of, of construction. Uh, ma many of the the members, uh, many may remember rather, that uh, the CDT, Caltrans, and, and PUC, uh, and the TPA uh, went to work immediately following passage of the 2021 Budget Act and, and SB 156, developing the initial network uh, design, uh, revising permitting processes, uh, going out to, to bid on construction and issuing an RFI squared solicitation uh, to find uh, lease and joint build partners. Uh, during all of this time, Caltrans has continued to work towards uh, completing permitting and design work on uh, to support a completion of the, the full MMBI network. All of these simul uh, uh, simultaneous efforts were necessary for, for meeting the federal deadline that we're continuing to pursue. Uh, this work has paid off, and uh, as you'll hear this morning, uh, the MMBI project is beginning to move firmly into the stage of uh, physical progress. Uh, 2024 is the year many of us uh, have been working towards uh, to move from planning uh, and design into construction. Uh, this morning, the CDT will provide an update on the status of its partnerships uh, and the anticipated start and completion dates uh, that are expected throughout 2024. 
Uh, similarly, Caltrans will be presenting its uh, much-anticipated schedule uh, for completing pre-construction and construction readiness throughout 2024. So we are entering into a new and exciting season that, that I think uh, we're, we've all been looking towards. Uh, through the regular MMAC meetings, the MMBI website, and other engagements, CDT has tried to keep the public up to date on the status of the project. Uh, yet we understand uh, for a project of this magnitude affecting this many Californians uh, and which uh, continues to move quickly, there is a need uh, for continuing uh, improvements in this effort. Uh, uh, this morning, CDT will be presenting a new stakeholder engagement plan, uh, new improvements to uh, its MMBI website, uh, and the clarification on how CDT will continue to communicate refinements uh, to the project. Uh, we also uh, begin some discussions this morning on, uh, on operations of the network uh, as we are uh, as we move forward with building here. Uh, the logical next step is uh, to to consider. Um, uh, to consider uh, yeah, what it's going to take to, to operate uh, and move, move into the, the operation stage in the future here. Uh, now we will also hear from the CPUC, uh, get CPUC's update on the important last mile programs that will provide the connectivity uh, that we're all been working towards here. This morning I want to highlight uh, two things that, uh, that have occurred since our last MMAC uh, meeting in October. Uh, the first is the, uh, we can go to the next slide, the first is uh, the CDT has gone out uh, with another RFI squared solicitation. Most will remember that the first time we did this, it yielded uh, a full two-thirds of the network, uh, which is now under contract. Uh, and so uh, some of the, the local stakeholders noted that they, they were aware of other providers that might have participated if locals had known more about the, uh, the first RFI squared. So to that end, CDT um, went out with another RFI squared solicitation in November to identify uh, uh, any more network miles that can be accelerated. Um, and held an innovators conference to uh, to present the project, uh, answer questions, and encourage participation. Uh, responses to this second RFI squared process are due uh, from bidders uh, January 26th, and CDT anticipates uh, negotiating and developing those proposals between February and July of this year. Uh, we are really hoping for a robust participation in this second RFI squared process. Uh, secondly, we can go to the next slide. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to note that the uh, governor's budget, which came out last week, includes uh, $1.5 billion in additional funding over two years uh, for, the, for this project. Uh, uh, it includes $250 million that uh, we would get in 2024-25, uh, um, uh, with the remaining uh, $1.25 billion in 2025-26. Uh, These new resources uh, will be key for funding both both Caltrans construction um, and any new partnerships uh, that we that, that we're able to uh, achieve through the new RFI squared process. And with that, um, uh, conclu concludes my executive report out. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Um, do any committee members have questions or comments about the executive report out? No. Nope. All right. I see none. So we'll go ahead and go to the next agenda item. Um, the first up is Monica Hernandez and Hung Leong, who are going to talk about stakeholder relations. Excuse me, Director, we actually have um, a bit more from Mark. Sorry, we ended a little bit too prematurely. So that was, okay. uh, yes, I have a, an additional, some, some updates to, to go through. So we can go to the next slide should be, yes, there we go. I uh, want to uh, point out um, in terms of our partnership, in addition to the RFI squared partnerships, uh, uh, we have um, been uh, glad to work with uh, the LA City Bureau of Lights, um, and the City of Vacaville, and the City of Fort Bragg, um, as they uh, basically sharing construction costs. And so, um, we've the three three different examples of government to government uh, arrangements. Where, uh, um, in the case of uh, the LA City Bureau of Lights. Uh, we're, we'll be doing a joint build with them. Uh, they're, they've got a lighting project, and this is going to uh, really help uh, achieve some savings for both of us in, in building this out. Uh, for the city of Vacaville, uh, we actually – uh, part of our Seven lease goes through the, the, the city, and we're, we'll be uh, – we've arranged for them to share the construction costs there uh, to, to really benefit both the city and the project. Um, and then in, in the case of the city of, of Fort Bragg, um, it's another joint build where uh, – uh, they'll be uh, working with us and, and, and sharing part of our construction contract to build out. So uh, we just want to highlight those and, and, and as well as encourage any other partners uh, that, that might think they have a project that might be able to help or we might be able to share construction costs, reach out to us, and we're happy to, um, we're happy to explore those opportunities. Uh, next, I want to provide an update on the status of the joint build and lease partnership projects. Uh, 
that uh, that were generated by CDT's previous RFI squared project. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that uh, um, in terms of uh, starting work, uh, Arcadian, uh, in December, uh, Arcadian broke ground on the first of five projects that will uh, total more than 1,000 miles of the network. Um, and then in this quarter, uh, we expect Lumen um, to begin uh, construction on its uh, segments, uh, which will uh, total almost 1,900 miles. Um, and this, this work primarily involves pulling fiber through existing conduit, as this is uh, largely a lease. Um, Zaya will begin uh, construction on its 193-mile uh, uh, joint build project along uh, State Route 395 in the northeastern region of the state. Um, and then um, in the next quarter, uh, Siskutel will begin its 165-mile uh, joint build project um, in Siskiyou County. Um, as well as Vero will also con uh, begin construction on its joint build project along State Route 101 in Humboldt. So, as I noted, we're moving to construction. Um, we can go to the next slide here. Um, because, because several of our partners um, had a uh, head start on their projects, we also want to uh, report on uh, some anticipated uh, completion timeframes. Um, Bolden is already well into its work uh, pulling new fiber and installing vaults. Uh, along its uh, more than 80-mile uh, lease area throughout the Bay Area and anticipates completing this work by the third quarter of this year. Uh, similarly, uh, TPN um, is well into construction on the 170-mile segment of the network that we will be leasing um, over State Route 299 um, and it anticipates uh, completing conduit fiber and vault installation uh, by the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, ZEA, which has, uh, I mentioned previously, has... Uh, um, already uh, started, will be starting construction this, um, in the next quarter. Um, it's uh, they've been under project, or they've been under project development for several years already, and so um, they anticipate completing um, their work uh, by the fourth quarter of this year. And um, and I'll just note that as we look at the, our partners completing their work after after the completion of these components, the state will need to uh, install uh, still so still need to install the huts and the electronics. Uh, which, uh, which is scheduled for 2025. 20, so you can see we're moving into construction and Caltrans will be providing more of an update on its, its work in a few minutes. Um, and I'll just note um, in terms of what's ahead, I'm gonna jump to the next slide. Uh, we've got uh, the electronics procurement. Um, I think ho hopefully uh, we've been able to explain um, the, the importance of electronics, that's those are the, they repeat the signal. We've got to have them in the huts every 50 miles. And so um, that is out and we expect um, bid, to receive bids next week on the electronics procurement. Uh, as I noted, we've got the RFI squared um, proposals that will be due in uh, on the 26th of January. Um, and then um, we can, we're looking forward to completion of pre-construction uh, on Caltrans segments uh, throughout 2024. And they'll be talking more about that um, and then in terms of uh, the rollout of the partner construction efforts here that, that we've just discussed. Um, I'll just note that, um, if we jump to the next slide real quick, um, as discussed, you know, as we begin to discuss the, the stakeholder engagement efforts, I want to note that um, uh, CDT has had more than 40 outreach engagements uh, since uh, the October MMAC meeting uh, with over 450 stakeholders invited, including uh, 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 tribes, um, uh, local governments, and, and a range of community organizations. So next I want to introduce uh, Monica Hernandez, uh, CDT's uh, communications deputy, uh, who will be presenting a new uh, stakeholder engagement plan, um, and um, Hong Myung from CDT's uh, uh, MMBI GIS team, um, who will be presenting uh, improvements to CDT's uh, MMBI website uh, surrounding uh, our ongoing efforts to provide better mapping data. So with that, I'll Turn it over to Monica. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, members. I'm Monica Hernandez, Deputy Director for Communications and Stakeholder Relations. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Um, you may recall I'm fairly new to this position. I'm just about three months in um, and excited to be joining uh, in the dynamic department and also work on this uh, fantastic project. So. Um, before you, you have a draft framework. Um, we wanted to really take a hard look at ourselves um, and in the spirit of continuous improvement and responding to your direction at the last MMAC to improve our transparency and stakeholder communication. Underpinning this framework is uh, our ways to address public comments as well, which um, I was here at the last MMAC that was uh, about two weeks in for me. So if I can have, oh, thank you. 
I want to talk briefly about something new that we want to introduce beginning next month, and that's uh, stakeholder meetings. So these are meetings that would be held ahead of forthcoming MMAC meetings where our teams, both uh, in partnership and collaboration with Caltrans and the Public Utilities Commission, we will provide updates. And why we want to do these stakeholder meetings is to truly create a two-way dialogue where stakeholders can ask questions in real time about the information we're presenting and we can respond and collaborate. Um, in these meetings, we also want to create um, a dialogue for the tough questions. Um, and we want to be able to engage with our stakeholders and really provide the information in a way that is accessible so stakeholders aren't beholden to just look at our website. This way we are um, being more proactive. So in these meetings, uh, in addition to holding those, we want to have an evaluation at each meeting that is both um, evaluating the content we're providing but creating an open opportunity for stakeholders to tell us what else they want us to provide. What other things are they curious about? What information um, might be helpful for them in their efforts to you know, support this project, support its success, and it continue to advance it? Uh, additionally, we are creating um, enhanced electronic commun communications. You're all familiar, I believe, with our monthly broadband for all newsletter, which has summary information. We're going to continue to use that tool but broaden what we provide in terms of the middle mile content and direct folks to um, a new section, which you will see shortly on our website, uh, that will have uh, not just a monthly update, but progress reports. So as we are continuing to make milestones, rather than hearing them on a quarterly basis, our stakeholders will get them on a monthly basis and then, as appropriate, will continue to update the website on a more frequent basis as well. For the stakeholder meetings, I do want to note um, our intended audiences are stakeholders like advocacy groups, associations, members of the public. I do want to highlight that uh, we do work on a government-to-government -government basis. So any public, uh, any municipality, city, county, a utility, a local utility that wants to engage with CDT will actually do that with our staff directly. So the examples you heard earlier around the joint builds with LA City Bureau of Lights, those communities, uh, those, stake, those partners, I should say, are not um, coming in through this stakeholder door. This really is our interested stakeholders, um, folks who are wanting to follow the project, wanting to be engaged, and wanting to have uh, the information that, that we are um, providing. And then if I can have the next slide, please. This is a snapshot of the What's New section of the Middle Mile uh, website. This will be updated at a minimum on the last Monday of each month that will include milestones. It will include information that is um, important to our stakeholders. It will include meetings. Uh, we will also include things like groundbreakings. We've had a number of groundbreakings, both Caltrans and our uh, joint build partners. And we want to celebrate that because we think it's very important to show the progress that we are making, as Mark noted, into construction from planning to implementation. And then if I can have the next slide, please. We're going to talk a little bit about our mapping improvements. We spent a lot of time over the last quarter really uh, thinking about the comments that we've heard from you, the direction that you gave us to think about ways we are communicating more effectively, more regularly, and in ways that are easy to understand, not overly technical with our stakeholders. So we have spent a lot of time working on our maps and our website. Uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about the improvements that we have made to have members of the public easily access on our online map joint build, lease, purchase um, partnerships. So with that, um, after that, we're going to talk through the specifics of the type of map updates that everyone should anticipate and why people should anticipate and why they are happening. That's a really important message that we hope you can take away. So if I can have uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. As you know, we unfortunately created some confusion with our map early on. This base map is what is on our website and should be really um, recognized as our conceptual map. This map was designed and conceptualized with the best data available at the time. We're moving towards a construction phase, and with construction phases comes 
more specific data, on the ground data. It's not at the 10,000 foot level. So as that data comes in, there are refinements from time to time. And those are not refinements that CDT is requesting. These are on the ground engineering refinements or issues like a physical barrier that you wouldn't see from that 10,000 foot design level. So we're gonna talk through some of those specifics. But before we um, move on to that, I'm gonna turn it over. Um, a couple of key points I wanna make. When we talk about um, the map updates, we've heard at the staff level that we need to be transparent and consistent. And so as we move through our presentation, we're gonna show you exactly how we're doing that. Um, I wanna turn it over to my colleague, Hong Leong, who has been an incredible partner in looking to find solutions and increase our transparency. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What we're looking on the screen is our map application with a view of the middle mile network at the state level. Thanks to the GIS team working behind the scenes. Next, please. We are excited to share that the partner level view will be available on the last Monday of this month. A preview is shown on the screen here. The colors indicate joint bill, lease, purchase, and construction. Clicking on one of the colored line will open up a pop-up window with the partner's information and highlight the span of the network. This example is for demonstration of purpose only. While I'm able to zoom through all the steps within one click in the slides, in real time using the map application, it'll take a couple more clicks to get to the partner, partner information. We're not demoing today in the interest of time. However, we will post a user guide on our website to anyone who needs it. In addition to the visualizations, we will also be adding a web page with the data in a table to ensure the information is accessible to anyone using a screen reader. Next, please. Another update coming this month is the map update log. This is what the stakeholders will see. We've built this log as a summary of updates and the construction partner driving the updates. While some of the updates are not visible unless a user zooms in closely, we want to be transparent in sharing the details and context. I will now turn it over to Mark to walk you through the type of map updates everyone should anticipate as the con construction of the network continues. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Leong, uh, for that presentation and, and for all the, team, the work that your team has done in putting together and preparing these improvements uh, to the MMBI project uh, to help it be more transparent. Um, the purpose of the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative uh, conceptual map uh, is to have a conceptual map to, to visualize a resilient uh, a Middle Mile Broadband network that will connect communities uh, that are unserved and underserved by broadband services. Uh, the conceptual routes were developed in accordance with SB 156 uh, with, uh, with the best available data and assumed the, the use of state-owned right-of-way for the, for the full network. As the MMBI network uh, moves from conceptual to, to detailed design and construction uh, and through the opportunities presented uh, through the, the joint builds, leases, and purchase um, agreements, uh, there are some route refinements are, uh, that are being updated um, on the MMBI website, um, and these will generally be driven by uh, data reconciliation, uh, permitting needs. Uh, we can go to the next next uh, slide. Uh, data reconciliation, permitting needs, uh, physical barriers uh, that are encountered along the way, um, and, as well as other network functionality needs. So um, if we can go to the next slide real briefly here, I'll kind of cover uh, some examples here. The lease purchase agreements make up uh, the vast majority uh, of the updates uh, we have seen and, and updates we anticipate. The, this, this slide here illustrates one primary reason for map adjustments, which is when an example of where uh, a lease, uh, in this case with CVIN, will run uh, slightly off of the state highway uh, system and the map will, be, will need to be uh, corrected to reflect this. You can see that the dotted line there. And go to the next line in terms of um, an example of a, a data cleanup um, occurs when we receive new data, a uh, new data file from partners um, and uh, its differences from uh, the, the base map 
in, in this case here, you can see where uh, there was always an intent to, for these two segments to connect. But um, uh, when you zoom into the map, there was a, there was a gap, and so we're trying to uh, to, to complete those that reconciliation. Um, and then uh, go to the next slide. Um, another example uh, of adjustments that will need to be made uh, to the map include those where uh, uh, given uh, inconsistent permitting and uh, project timeframes. In this case. Uh, Construction, uh, you know, another construction project along uh, State Route 99. It makes uh, it may make more sense for a partner to move off of the state highway network um, to uh, to speed up completion of the project. Um, and so uh, that's um, in in a lot of cases. I know we've tried to do uh, dig smart projects where that makes sense, but there might be cases where it just makes more sense to be off of the state highway network. Um, the next, uh, we'll go to the next slide here. This slide reflects uh, an instance where the map runs into a physical barrier. In this case, uh, a, a section of uh, State Route 105 that crosses uh, LAX. Uh, in this case, we're moving the route to a frontage road uh, to ex expedite delivery, um, since we can't build along, uh, along LAX, or that would be a long and complicated process. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, uh, lastly, there, there's an example of uh, a change driven by network functionality. In this case, uh, there was a, a gap in the original map due to the fact that this segment is not on the state highway system. You can see the dotted line there. Um, in this case, uh, we, ha we are having the TPA work with Caltrans to build this connection uh, to improve the resiliency and close this gap. And so if we go to the next slide. Uh, just to recap, uh, CDT will be posting these updates on a monthly basis. Uh, we will be posting changes uh, on a uh, to, on an updated uh, the the log that um, uh, that uh, Ms. Leong uh, mentioned on our website, um, and these adjustment summaries will be posted on our uh, What's New section of our website. And we're hoping that this this really helps uh, provide better and more up to date information on how uh, communities uh, can uh, connect to the Middle Mile. And then um, and as I wrap up uh, CDT's uh, project update, I want to turn to uh, Scott Adams, the Deputy Director for the Office of Broadband and Digital Literacy, uh, to make a brief statement on the, the progress of the state's digital equity plan. Scott? Yeah, so thanks. <laughs> thanks, Deputy Director Romano. Um, uh, uh, I'm Scott Adams, Deputy Director of Broadband and Digital Literacy. Uh, it's a pleasure to provide a brief update on the state digital equity Plan, which falls under the umbrella of the state broadband for all program. Just wanted to let folks know that the uh, draft SDEP was developed with input from over 50,000 California residents and partners and was made public on December 12th of last year, which began a 45 day public comment process. Um, any residents or partners interested in reviewing the draft and providing public comment to further shape the plan may do so until the close of the public comment period, which is next Thursday, January 25th. The plan can be found on the Broadband for All portal, State Digital Equity um, Planning webpage. And uh, just want to note that we'll be uh, providing a further update on the Digital Equity Plan at next week's California Broadband Council meeting. Back to you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, there were three points that I uh, neglected to state in my presentation that I think are very relevant and I know um, you care about. Um, as stated, we will be publishing map, map updates on the last Monday of each month, but we will also keep a historical log of the previous uh, version of the map on the website as well, so that anyone who's interested is not having to memorize or somehow do some sort of screenshot. So that was um, really important. I wanted you to um, be aware of that. Um, additionally, we have um, a half mile threshold of a route refinement would uh, necessitate a local briefing so that the local leaders, the local electeds will be briefed on any route refinement that is a half mile or greater. Um, additionally, if it is uh, moved to one side of a significant physical barrier or another, that local community, even if it is just a quarter mile, will be notified as well and briefed so that they are aware of what's happening. As well, uh, my third point is that our CDT staff have developed a process for consultation with the PUC on any FFA applications 
associated with um, any route refinements. So the teams will be working on those. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Hernandez. And with that, um, that ends uh, CDT's uh, project update. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Moreau, Ms. Hernandez, Ms. Leong, and Mr. Adams. <laughs> Very comprehensive Department of Technology update. I'd like to open it up to the members to see if they have any questions or comments uh, for the team. I see Secretary Tong, uh, always first in line. So, Secretary Tong, would you like to make a question? I don't have to be the first if there's other member who wants to jump in first, but I, I do have uh, a, a few questions I, I wanted to talk to the presenters now just to clarify. Um, but Again, I don't want to be the first all the time. Um, all right, I'm just going to go. Um, so th th thank you, team, for that comprehensive um, update. I really, really appreciate the extra effort that has been showcased today and um, in really re in response to the public comments that has been you know, uh, articulated in the past few meetings about what can be done to increase the transparency whenever there is a map or, or I should say, lined modification. And in this case, um, I wish, uh, uh, Mr. Monroe, you can go a little bit slower on those uh, examples of why the lines need to be moved. Um, but I, I appreciate, Ms. Hernandez, your summary is that sounds like the threshold for these type of lines not only to be displayed on the website to showing what the differences are, there's also, if it's more than half mile, which is, you know, quite small, so I really appreciate the extra effort. There's going to be extra briefing that can be held uh, with the local community or those interested party to, to hear that. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, our immediate audience would be the city, county, local staff, um, and we would encourage them, as you know, it's a big state, and right. we don't know all of the local stakeholders, so we would rely on the, the locals to help us bring in additional stakeholders. Yeah. No, that, that, that is, that's very, very good. And, and also, um, I also want to acknowledge the fact that, and, and just for someone that has been tracking this project quite closely, um, you know, it's very, uh, I'm very, very appreciative of the CDT's effort to, to go the extra mile to deliberately show the difference of why these lines are happening. Because if you only hear or not knowing this detail, you know, somehow people think, saying, oh, willingly, willingly, you know, CTT just kind of sitting around moving these lines around, but the reality is that are either due to necessity of there's a barrier, like the LAX uh, airport example, that you don't want to go through that, you, you do need to move, um, as well as that when you zoom into a particular area, you want to close the small gap that might be left, you know, uh, open before, as well as if there's a permitting opportunity, which I know Caltran appreciate that, and I know... Uh, 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 assembly member, uh, I, I know many of our elected officials have also to look for this a build smart or leverage existing efforts. So if there's a permitting opportunity, then you can leverage, let's do that rather than starting something new. And so I, I, I very much appreciate and I encourage our audience who's tracking all of these development, take the time to utilize this information that is available online um, to really understand what is going on before um, perhaps, you know, conclusion were made on why these lines are moved around. So I just want to, you know, make that a, 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 a known fact to folks. Um, just, just to close on my, uh, that was more of a statement than question, sorry. Uh, I do have a question just to close my comment here. Um, Mr. Hernandez, you mentioned earlier there is a stakeholder list or gathering um, that is different than the government to government, which is cited as, you know, cities or even tribal we treat them as a more of a government to government. Um, can you elaborate that on that a little bit? Because we do have organizations who works with the cities versus the actual city themselves. And sometimes, you know, there is a mixture of who's actually representing the city. So can you maybe elaborate a little bit about engagement of stakeholders, you know, truly versus government to government? Sure. Um, with the stakeholders, we're wanting to bring in, while we wouldn't, uh, preclude a city or county staff member from attending. This really is targeted for partners like uh, advocacy groups, members of the public, folks who are interested and engaged but maybe don't have a, an official capacity in terms of being able to partner for things like a joint build, to partner to reduce um, a permit, a streamline, 
that that type of government to government function. Um, we did, uh, we will, uh, like we would never say you can't come or you, you know, kick somebody out of a meeting, but this really is for um, the stakeholders who are not city, county, public employees. Um, also organizations um, that represent like the rural counties, mm -hmm. uh, associations that, uh, for example, California um, Association of Councils of Governments, right? That's the associations of COGS. Those types of uh, mm. quasi-governmental associations are also included. Um, we have a, a stakeholder list that is already established, but um, we will encourage, you know, you don't have to be on our list to, to attend. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you so much for that. And then if, if there's a, that um, clear differentiation, which I applaud you for doing so, I would recommend on the plan that you share, actually call it out the difference between stakeholder meeting versus government to government. Um, so a little bit more definitive. Thank you. But the, the, the idea here is that if you don't have a you know, local government's quote-unquote official title, there's more than one channel for um, anybody who is interested is to engage with CDT. Thank you. Yes, I yeah. will do that. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, President Reynolds. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by thanking all the presenters. Um, I really appreciated the presentation. And uh, Mr. Monroe, it is exciting to be in 2024 where we can start seeing construction begin. Um, so that's great to hear. And um, I wanted to comment on the website updates. I appreciate the clarity of the updates and having a you know, kind of known schedule of the first Monday of the month so the public knows um, when to look for updates. And then I just wanted to specifically thank you for engaging with CPC staff. We stand ready to coordinate and engage with you all on the updates. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, President Reynolds. Is there any other comments or questions? All right, Mr. Kiever. Yeah, Ms. Hernandez, uh, just to follow up on the uh, stakeholder meetings, I think uh, I think it's a wonderful addition to our, our outreach and engagement. Question I have, those that are interested and are maybe uh, hearing about them, how do they sign up? Will there be something on the website? How do they indicate their interest and, and get engaged? Great question. Um, I will note that at the end of this slide, there's an email that um, anyone can email us. Um, additionally, on the Middle Mile website, there's a contact um, on the top navigation bar. You can contact. There's also an email in there. But we will be using our existing lists as well. So some of our folks are here in the room with us today. I know many are listening. Um, but if you are not on that list, um, if I can I believe it is middle mile. I'm going to look at my colleagues. I apologize for not having that, that middle mile email memorized. I, I can also note that um, on our website, there's a contact us tab, and that will take you directly to our email, and you can contact us that way. I, I don't want to say the wrong email. I apologize. It's middle mile at state.ca.gov. Thank you. Thank you. And Supervisor Alejo. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to commend the staff um, for recognizing the need of always trying to strive to improve communication for a project of this size um, and, and such of great importance to our, our cities, our communities across the state. Um, I, I appreciate the extra efforts that we're doing here. And it's, uh, it shows that we're responding to what we're hearing from our stakeholders that participate and are interested in, the, in this effort. Um, on the on the just a couple questions. One was on the website um, updates. Will it also list um, the entities or the businesses that we're leasing from? Uh, we had our California State Association of Counties um, yesterday, and some of the supervisors in places like in Modoc County were interested in who are we leasing it from? Is it Sevan or Lumen? Will that that information be on these um, website updates? Yes, that is both um, available on the website. Uh, update log and then the map that we showed that had the multicolored layers, those are um, executed agreements and it does uh, display the entire network by the partner. So you could click on um, a specific segment and it will light up and it will show you who the development partner is. And another question I think it was for Mark. Um, we had talked about this um, previously, but um, when there is changes to, to the maps and um, and they may they may result, for example, um, an increased cost because now 
um, there may be a physical barrier river that causes um, ad additional cost. And Mark had had it was explaining to me that um, every area has um, a federal funding uh, account caseworker. But the question was, um, um, what kind of resources are available um, when there is um, additional cost or um, um, the the project needs to be um, addressed with with additional um, kind of difficulties? Would there be funding or other assistance to local communities to to um, to address those um, um, added costs to the project? Yeah, so um, no, thank you for that question. Um, yes, and, and, and going back to you know any of the, the map adjustments we make, we understand that in some cases they're going to be closer to some communities and further away from other communities than they were planning. Um, and, and while we're still serving the same corridors, there might be some barriers. Uh, and so uh, I, I, we, we've worked with the talked with the Public Utilities Commission about this, and, and their their direction is to reach out with to their FFA caseworkers um, to, uh, to to look for options. Um, I, I can't speak to all, all of the, the options that the, uh, uh, the caseworkers um, might be able to work on, but they're, they're, they're advising everyone when you look at the map and, and they, after submitting an FFA uh, grant, and if there's a, a variance or, or anything that's, uh, that needs to be assumed differently to connect to the middle mile to reach out to um, the, the, the PUC caseworker uh, to be able to, uh, to look for alternatives for closing that gap. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Are there any members virtually? Assembly Member oh, Wood. Oh, Assembly Member Wood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very much appreciate the update. Um, uh, with regard to stakeholders, um, are you, I, I heard a lot of different groups that were mentioned there. Are you including uh, consortiums, uh, some of them that are actually uh, trying to cobble together the funding uh, for the last mile projects, any of these little changes, little mile that may have a potential dramatic effect on the ability to deliver the last mile. And um, with our goal of trying to get internet or uh, broadband to everyone, I just want to know that these folks are actually on your stakeholder list. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, so remember, yes, that is correct. Um, the um, uh, the consortia would be included as, as part of that outreach. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Member Wood, is there any other questions? Uh, the only question or clarification I like to ask of the team is we talked about the RFI squared and the government to government partnerships and sometimes we're just working through that process and I know the RFI squared process has a, a deadline coming up and and we've done a lot of outreach and continue to do more outreach. In fact, the, we talked about the LA Bureau City of Lights, and then there was three that you highlighted to today, and there are others that are uh, potentially in, um, in line to have conversations with us. It might be helpful for the public to understand kind of the difference, and would a government to government have the same deadline potentially as the RFI square? Thank you very much for that question. That's a really important point. No, um, any government, to, any governments that want to reach out to us, always err on the side of contacting us. Uh, reach out to us and let's look for alternatives. But no, uh, that's, that's a really important point. Is that the RFI Square process does not, or the, the time frame and process does not apply to the government to government um, uh, negotiations and discussions that we've been having and the, the deals we've been reaching there. So uh, definitely reach out to us um, when you know. Immediately, it's, and, and it will be addressed, and we'll, we'll have the chance to, to look for that, that those efficiencies there outside of that RFI squared process. Thank you for the clarification. All right, we'll go ahead and go to the next agenda item, and that is our Caltrans partner with Janice Benton. All right, thank you. Good morning and happy new year, Chair Bailey Crimmins, committee members, and others from the public. Um, as uh, Chair said, my name is Janice Benton. I am the Assistant Deputy Director over the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative for Caltrans and will be providing an update on the progress being made for the Caltrans portion of the Middle Mile Broadband Network. Next slide. My update will focus on the Department's progress since October, including the headway being made in pre-construction work to have the projects ready to construct and putting work into the hands of contractors. I want to reinforce our commitment to having the Caltrans build miles ready to construct this year and to complete construction on these segments of the middle mile network by 2026. Next slide. 
So as shared at previous MMAC meetings, this slide shows the progress we are making on the pre-construction work for the Caltrans build. This indicates the work we need to do to complete the design and secure the necessary environmental and right-of-way approvals and permits. For the tasks associated with the pre-construction work, Caltrans has completed 40% of those tasks with the remaining 60% of the project tasks in progress. Next slide. The result of these pre-construction tasks is that this calendar year, the Caltrans build segments will be construction ready. This slide shows a map of the Caltrans build with the segments in green. To start the year, we expect 394 miles to be ready to construct in the first quarter. And when these miles are combined with the approximately 70 miles already in construction, it reflects the estimate shared at the October MMAC that by the end of March 2024, we would start construction in each region across the state on approximately 450 miles of the Caltrans build. For the second quarter, by the end of June, an additional 235 miles are expected to be ready to construct, and in the third quarter, an additional 1,170 miles will be ready. And by the end of the fourth quarter, December 2024, another 2,128 miles will be ready to construct. Next slide. What this means is that over the course of this year, Caltrans is anticipating having more than 3,900 miles ready to construct. The map on the slide reflects how the green lines, which are the Caltrans build segments, connect with the dark gray lines, which are the joint build, lease, and purchase segments that have been discussed earlier in this conversation. And as you look at the various locations of the Caltrans build, it also reveals the branches we are building and how these miles extend the connectivity of the network into some of the remote communities. Factoring in the geography of the state, this also shows the challenges facing the Caltrans build with segments winding through foothills, along the coast, and in the mountains. While we have the challenging miles, I want to reinforce that we anticipate all 3,900 miles to be ready to construct this year with the commitment to complete construction of the entire Caltrans build by December 2026. Next slide. And to that end, I'm really excited to share some examples of the construction and work underway on the Caltrans build segments. The photos on the left show work in Riverside County on State Route 74, where we are leveraging a Dig Smart opportunity to include approximately 11 miles of the network with a transportation project. The photos on the right and in the middle show the trenching and conduit installation happening on an 11 mile segment on State Route 20 in Mendocino County. And not shown on this slide, in Death Valley National Park on State Route 190, the contractor will be incorporating some of the middle mile broadband elements into the emergency work being done to repair the highway washout. Further, work orders are being initiated on other segments, such as 12 miles in Lassen and Shasta counties, six miles in Lake County, and more than 40 miles in Los Angeles and Ventura counties. Thank you for your time. This concludes the Caltrans update. Thank you, Ms. Benton. I'd like to open it up to the members to see if they have any questions. And I see Secretary Tong. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait to see if anybody else want to chime in. No, you guys are all just giving me the eye that I should just go. All right. Um, I just I, I thank you, uh, Ms. Benton, for that presentation. And I think it's really um, good to see. And I know that was something that was discussed at the last MMAC meeting um, last year to have Caltrans laid out by quarterly. What are the total miles? So this is very very helpful. I think the question I wanted to maybe um, clarify is the fact that while um, I'll just use the word nearly 4,000 that are going to be built by Caltrans. And Caltrans are still very much involved in working with um, other miles that are predominantly, let's say, joint bill, maybe not so much on the lease, in the permitting side of it, in make, making sure that those permitting processes are continue as fast as it's possible, humanly possible, so those joint um, built opportunities are, are moving forward. Is, is that a correct understanding? Yes, absolutely, Secretary. Um, so we're we're not only working with the joint builders or the third party builders that are coming in and, and they'll be getting an encroachment permit from Caltrans, but we're also uh, bringing in and leveraging all those other programmatic efforts so they can take advantage and leverage those streamlining and, and efficiencies to get their projects through. Um, we've also put together some guidance to help them. So we put toge together guidance not only for our Caltrans district folks, but also for all the 
uh, third-party builders so they can know what's out there available for them to help streamline um, the process. That's great. And if I may suggest uh, maybe at some point one of these um, you know, public meetings, I, I know at the beginning there was a lot of trackers about you know, how the permitting uh, work uh, is progressing, and then this meeting is coming back to what is actual construction you know, for those that are Caltrans building, but perhaps at one of the upcoming might be good to resurface you know, how those permit streamlining it's taking place in Caltrans because I've heard a lot of positive story where the, the, the number of days or months that are needed uh, to obtain those uh, permitting have really, really um, uh, shortened due to the great work that Caltrans and CDT have been working on, those programmatic approach that Ms. Yeah. Benton, you were talking yeah. about. So I just perhaps suggest the chair that, and, and, and uh, Mr. Kiefer here, that, that perhaps um, at one of the upcoming meeting can uh, refer, resurface that whole permit streamlined effort. Um, and then just to conclude on this, and again, I, 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 I'm glad you pointed out, Ms. Benton, that on the map where the ones that are Caltrans construction focusing on are really, really those areas that do not have existing line or is a really hard to reach area. And therefore, the work involved on those has much more complex, complexity. And so I just want to applaud uh, from, you know, for Caltrans for continue doing those because those are the area that um, without um, the state putting, you know, our own priority of focus on probably would never happen. So thank you for that. Thank you, Secretary. Any questions, comments from any members? Uh, virtually, Alicia, because I can see. I um, I'd like to also thank the, uh, see you know Caltrans for their partnership because not only are we seeing significant progress in streamlining permitting where we, we're we're at the tip of the spear and and really actually leading the nation on how you can streamline permitting so my hats off to Caltrans and everything that you've been doing in this realm um, having that many miles ready for construction by the end of of this year um, again hats off to you and your districts. But something that also I'm not sure if the public is aware, but all the things that we're doing on making sure that based on the right of way, once it's in the ground, making sure we have that partnership on the ongoing, because that is also very important over the next lifetime to make sure that this relationship is, that we talk about is a long-term marriage between uh, Department of Technology and uh, Caltrans. And so I just really want to commend you on everything that we've been doing uh, to make this critical asset uh, available to the California residents. So sometimes we always get thought thinking about project and the delivery, but it's also really the ongoing that, that matters. So I wanted to thank you. I want to thank you. Um, your director, Tavares, and obviously you, Janice, for everything that you've been doing from a leadership perspective. All right. I don't see any other questions or comments, so we now are shifting to the operating model. And as we invite our next round of speakers up here, uh, jo Joanne Hovis and Eric Hunsinger, to um, the dais, I'd like to just uh, highlight that this has been a topic that we've talked about. You know, long-term, short-term decisions have long-term impacts, and we are bringing in an uh, expert, uh, um, Joanne Helvis from CTC Technology and Energy, that has been doing this. I think it's probably part of her DNA when we think about broadband and addressing the digital divide and really has an experience not only looking at it from a California lens, but what's really going on across the nation. And we wanted to bring that information back to the, the, the council so that we're talking about, yes, California is there there really is no comparison to us we usually lead the nation but it's still important that we keep an eye on what's going on there's different operating models out there that are being successful or having challenges so we want to make sure that this committee has that insight and be able to ask an expert we also have the partnership that we um, value uh, from golden state net and eric hunsinger who has been really looking at what's necessary for california uh, again, we're very complex, and so I uh, just wanted to make sure that we are talking about this both at a, at a national level and a California level as we go into the next phase. So I just wanted to tee that up for everyone. Um, and then I know at the end of your presentation, Mark has a few comments. So the first step is Joanne Hovis. Again, thank you very much. much. I, I think you've been flying internationally, uh, and you're just back in the country, so we are lucky to have you. And you represent CTC Technology and Energy, so um, I'll turn it over to you.
Thank you, Director. Um, thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and I have um, the pleasure of um, giving you a, a kind of broad overview of some of the observations and lessons learned from the last couple of decades of public and nonprofit middle mile networks that have been deployed and operated in other states throughout the country. Um, as the director just noted, California is obviously quite singular in everything, and MMBI is an order of magnitude larger than any other network of this sort, which is appropriate given the size and scale um, of the state and the need that is represented here for middle mile uh, capabilities. But some of the observations and lessons learned over the past couple of decades um, will, I think, be instructive as uh, operations are considered and this next phase of planning is undertaken while construction is underway. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so what I will um, share is just a, a high-level um, overview of some of what experience suggests with regard to what operations might look like and particularly the uh, likelihood of um, a self-sustaining network, a network that pays for itself out of its own revenues while still meeting its public policy goals, which are obviously the primary reason for the existence of a publicly owned middle mile network. Um, and what we see in other states that may be analogous here as this planning is undertaken for MMBI um, and the additional um, questions and analysis that um, can be undertaken in coming months. Can I have the next slide, please? Generally, um, we'll share you know, uh, just a few high-level overview, a few high-level points um, in overview, in that experience suggests that large publicly owned and nonprofit owned middle mile networks can sustain themselves. Generally, the great majority of them have done so. Um, and where we have seen substantial challenges over time or networks that are considered to have failed, that has largely been because of some kind of an execution challenge, um, sometimes on the public side, sometimes uh, because of legal complications, sometimes because of a private partner that could not execute. Um, but it's not the fundamental underlying economics of the network itself that has been the challenge. It's rather been on the execution side. And I think that's sometimes not understood with regard to um, the overall operating model of a larger middle mile network. Um, generally, though, these networks are not self-sustaining only from last mile ISP revenues. And I think that, you know, it is really intuitive. In some ways it goes without saying because there would not be a need for a public middle mile network if there were a, um, a financially self-sustaining model or a financially profitable model that would support the network itself because the private sector would then step in. Um, so, I'm not saying that they're not self-sustaining. Generally, these networks are, but not solely from ISP revenues. Rather, and if I can have the next slide, please, what we see is that the networks sustain themselves by serving those last mile ISPs that are at the heart of that public policy purpose of a middle mile network, but also serving a range of other customers in order to maximize the value of that public investment, in order to make sure that this remarkable resource that fiber represents, and it really is this astonishingly capable, scalable asset that has been invested in by the public sector, that it can be maximized to serve a wide range of different kinds of stakeholders, including first and foremost, internet service providers, including wireless internet service providers, mobile providers, fixed providers, the full range of last mile entities that serve residents, businesses, institutions, et cetera, but also other kinds of customers, including public users and other kinds of large um, users that are frequently considered middle mile users. And generally, um, our assessment would be that MMBI uh, you know, on a preliminary basis, our analysis is that MMBI should fit into that same framework of self-sustaining based on that full range of different kinds of users. Um, but our recommendation is certainly that um, a 
robust market sounding and market analysis be undertaken um, along those lines as part of the planning process. Um, and um, I will stop there. That is my high-level overview. Thank you, Ms. Hovis. Um, any questions from committee members before we go to Eric Hunziker? Um, I just might, one of my questions is, can you give any examples? I know that you have worked with many states. Um, <clears throat> is there anyone that you know we should be reaching out to? Or again, you you have a, a national lens. So any any thoughts from your perspective that the committee should be considering that there's a good use case out there? I know you do a lot of research. You know there are a range of them, probably a couple dozen. I might highlight just a, a substantial handful with the caveat always that from a California vantage point, these are always going to seem like they're pretty small, but just the nature of things being that. So like my home state is Maryland, and we're very proud of our publicly owned middle mile network in Maryland, but we understand that we fit into just a few of your counties, maybe even just a couple of your counties. Um, but the, um, the One Maryland Broadband Network is a now, I think, 14-year-old publicly owned statewide network. It reaches into every county, goes to every county seat. It provides um, capacity and services that then allow for provision of services to almost um, all of the schools in the state. It provides for uh, lower cost um, sharing of um, services for public entities. And then the um, Maryland Broadband Cooperative, which is a nonprofit partner to the um, to the state um, operates um, much of that fiber capacity on an open access basis for dozens of ISPs throughout the state. Um, those are the kinds of models that are out there that we think are uh, important opportunities uh, to learn from. There are um, many other networks that are similar throughout the state. Washington State has something called NOAA-NET. Um, uh, uh, the uh, Illinois Century Network in the state of Illinois operated on much, uh, on very similar model um, with the state itself actually providing those services internally rather than using an operations partner. NOAA is a nonprofit, by the way. There are higher education nonprofits throughout the country that do similar things. Michigan, for example, portions of Texas. Um, I, uh, again, smaller in scale, but a range of different models, and then new emerging models in the current moment as well, given the emphasis nationally and the incredibly high priority placed by policymakers on broadband and on middle mile. We are seeing new emerging models in a handful of states for new kinds of collaboration among public owners of fiber assets or conduit assets and um, their private operations collaborators. Um, where many of those collaborators are taking on um, considerable amounts of the operating risk in collaboration with the public entity. Um, and we're seeing models like that emerge uh, currently in uh, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, um, and other states. Thank you. Very informative. Um, any questions? Assembly oh, I do. Member I see Wood. Assembly Member Wood. Yes, thank you, uh, and it's very interesting. I, I, I am curious, um, uh, in other states in particular, um, or your home state, um, how, 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 how is maintenance working? You have an accident or a storm, um, and, and who's paying for, who's, who's actually doing the work to make, keep the, uh, the middle mile up and running in, in Maryland? So in Maryland, that underlying asset, which is owned by the state, is maintained by a contractor that is um, paid by the state, a competitively procured contractor that offers um, the best possible prices. Now, Maryland is considerably smaller than California. A single contractor, even in a small state like Maryland, is sometimes more challenging. But um, maintenance services in terms of um, the need to repair in the event of a storm or a cut or um, a, you know, a car hits a pole and the line goes down, those are specialized and important services, but they're really in many ways commodity services and they can be acquired in the competitive market at pretty competitive prices. 
Um, in some places, they are provided by public entities who have that expertise as well. But um, in most states, our experience has been that uh, private entities are um, contracted at competitive rates to offer maintenance services. Um, and finally, a rough idea of what the cost of that, and, and that, that's, a, that's a really difficult question, obviously, Maryland's a much smaller state, um, but uh, you know, is that a significant cost and, and is that revenue for that coming out of a department budget or general fund or, or where, is it, where is it coming from? Generally, where these networks are self-sustaining, um, that self-sustaining model includes paying for maintenance. So that it has been my experience that in most cases the um, the network um, will, out of revenues, um, and if it's purely a state network, that might be an internal chargeback mechanism. But whatever the revenue source is, um, the that is sufficient to cover maintenance. Um, the cost of maintenance is going to vary dramatically depending on markets and topographic factors and whether the the uh, infrastructure is aerial or underground. But one very high-level benchmark just for conceptual planning purposes is to think of fiber and conduit maintenance as being about equivalent to 1% of um, capital costs for construction of the fiber. And that's with a very big caveat that it's very much localized, but that's a, a nice planning benchmark. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Assembly Member. Um, uh, Secretary Tong. Um, yes, just a, a quick follow up on that. This is very interesting information. Thank you for sharing that and chair for Thank you for teeing that up. I, I uh, unfortunately going to have to leave early, and uh, Deputy Secretary Russell Atterbury is going to step in uh, to cover uh, the seat. Um, um, so, uh, Eric, sorry, I'm going to have to miss your presentation, but I think this is a very timely com conversation to have, knowing that you know some of these meta mile line is going to start being lighting up in 2025, 2026, and coupled with the uh, last mile lines that's going to come up. Um, uh, under the oversight of CPUC. So, you know, these type of uh, ongoing maintenance and cost and, and projection is going to be important. And the fact that, you know, the, the middle mile uh, mix of the middle mile, whether it's Caltrain construction or, or um, lease or joint bill, are continue to evolve. So that's probably going to add a, a layer of um, complexity. It's not the right word, but update needs to how these operating models should be evaluated. So I'm very uh, interested to continue to have more dialogue on this and love to have um, you know, updates on how nationally or internationally how these are being handled. So thank you for, for the topic. Thank you, Secretary Tong. And, and that is a, a great point that she's um, pointing out is that the RFI squared, we're still, we know there's interest, but the network is evolving. And as the network is evolving, um, we will have a, in a better place as we get to April, what that potentially will look like. And we want to make sure that whatever model that we are selecting to be an operation and maintenance and operation model is something that's going to work for California. And I think the partnership between both, both yourself and Golden State Net is, is helpful for this committee to get where we need to go and make sure that we're making the right decisions on behalf of the Californians that are looking at us to um, make this an affordable um, program for, for everyone. So thank you very much, Joanne. Uh, is there any other questions before we shift over to uh, Eric Hunzinger? I see none. So M Mr. Eric Hunzinger from Golden State Net. Uh, thank you, Director Bailey Crimmins. So, um, you know, there's a couple of things that really distinguish what the state's doing. We've uh, talked about the size and scale here. Uh, for the state of California. It's been almost a quarter century since any entity has built a 10,000 mile network. And the last one that was built was commercial in nature. So this opportunity that the uh, CDT in the state of California has pursued is, is really nothing short of historic. Not only is it addressing uh, at risk and need areas in rural areas where uh, commercial networks have been unable to justify construction, but it's uh, bridging markets that uh, would never be solved unless this effort was undertaken. But there's some, there's some things that the state of California has put in place that really distinguish this network for, over anything that's been built previously. Uh, and those 
those things are, are actually may seem fairly minor, but they are going to represent significant cost reductions going forward as we build last mile infrastructure. The first thing is um, CDT has implemented the interconnection policy of flexible uh, streamlined connections between brick and mortar locations. You don't have to go to a particular address. You don't have to design this according to buildings like traditional telecom networks. You can come right to the network in the state of California, CDT will introduce a connection point within the network to reduce construction costs on the last mile. So that means that within, a, can we go to the next slide, Alicia, thank you. So that means within a 10,000 mile network, you have more than 20,000 access points. There will be 20,000 access points built prematurely into the network, but you can add additional ones. That means that last mile uh, infrastructure can reduce all of their construction costs to get directly into the network that CDT has designed. In addition to that, uh, CDT is planning to uh, light the infrastructure with uh, cutting edge uh, telecommunications equipment. As noted earlier, they're going through the RFP process. I believe that's uh, due out uh, shortly, but uh, it's estimated there's gonna be about 4,000 pieces of equipment in this to run this network. Um, that means communities across California are gonna get access to in 100, 800 gig circuits that they could utilize for their planning purposes to drive broadband in their communities. But in order to support that infrastructure, um, there's certain elements that have to be established operationally. And that, uh, you know, a basic one is a 24 seven knock requirement, which can uh, incorporate a, an element of customer care and support. Um, but then on top of that, regular maintenance needs to occur. As Ms. Hovis noted, it's typically 1% on networks, and that includes, uh, you know, protecting those facilities, those huts that need to drive the network and make it work. Um, but then the repair, as Assemblymember Wood had noted, the repairs and uh, maintenance on the work on the fiber network itself when it gets cut is an important element and it has to be managed aggressively. Uh, typically, carriers will share that cost across dark fiber customers, so that's an element of, a, of the contract that gets written as part of the customer provider relationship. So those costs will be shared uh, for, by users on the network, uh, only for those areas where the cut or maintenance needs to occur. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a, an overview of the, um, probably a 10,000 foot view of the operational areas that are needed to support the network. Um, from the moment of engagement with the user of the network, typically sales uh, uh, engagement, um, all the way through engineering and planning and uh, maintenance, as well as invoicing for services on the network. Uh, so this is a general overview with some of the activities necessary to make the network sustainable and actually function uh, like a true telecom network. And then uh, there's a variety in the, of uh, data flow here in the systems touching on the various elements of the network that are needed to be tracked, like where's the fiber, what sort of activity has been done on the fiber, where are the interconnection points relevant. As things break down, you want to know those elements so that you can repair it appropriately so there's continuity in the network and, uh, you know, use, usable by constituents of, uh, of, of the network. So all of these elements in the systems are necessary in order to uh, make it sustainable and uh, function uh, as an operating model. Next slide, please. So we, we've done some preliminary work, but we're still in the early stages of uh, understanding how to engage users on the network. It's not a simple matter of just connecting to them, right? We want to um, uh, understand the cost structure it's tough to know what that cost structure for uh, making sustainability uh, an element of uh, the program without having it in the ground first because we don't know those final costs. 
Uh, we've got most of those in place. We still need to turn up the uh, layer two uh, uh, on the network with the equipment, layer two and three. Um, this has never been done before. I mentioned that it's been 25 years since a 10,000 mile network was done, but that was a commercial network geared towards prioritizing um, uh, revenues, right? Uh, you know, going to major cities, uh, hitting uh, places where they knew uh, uh, hyperscalers and commercial entities were interested in. This was not geared around erasing the digital divide. So what the state of California is doing is, uh, is turning that model upside down. Uh, and so in many ways, the policies and programs that they're putting in place to erase the digital divide the, by allowing flexibility of interconnection is going to change the whole landscape of cost structure communities around the, the, the state. Um, so we know the size, we know the scale, uh, but we need to understand better what's going to work for California because it's a unique place. And so with uh, CTC, CDT, and uh, uh, Golden State Net, we're committed to uh, unwrapping the best practices and approaches to uh, provide this network for the people of California. Um, I also want to point out that, uh, you know, through the, uh, the SB 156, it's pretty clear an open access network. All users are welcome, right? So it's an opportunity to really drive demand on this network. Uh, so the foresight in that bill uh, really opens it up for the success of this network. So it's uh, uh, an important element to, to allow carriers, hyperscalers, ISPs, Communities, anybody with a demand for the network, their capacity and the capabilities will be there with the infrastructure CDT is designed. That all close out my comments. Thank you, Director Bay of the Permits. Thank you, Eric. Um, and <clears throat> excellent, excellent comments. I know that I wanted to go ahead and turn it over to Mark Monroe to close out the operations segment and then we'll open it up for questions. All right. Thank you both for your insights. Um, we really appreciate. Uh, you both sharing your, your industry expertise uh, with us. Uh, CDT will continue to, uh, to work with its partners in considering how best uh, to develop a sustainable uh, approach for, for operation of the network and uh, um, in a way that really benefits all Californians. And that's, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Mr. Hunsinger noted the, you know, the policy priorities of SB 156, um, and, and that's, that's really key is that we're trying to reach the, the unserved uh, throughout the state. And so want to develop a network that does that. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm hearing is we are moving forward with a market sounding that will uh, bring results back here uh, potentially to this committee in April to be able to start making some good decisions on moving forward. We'll have the RFI squared. I know um, Eric's been new in Israel, so I'll be looking at that and, and obviously looking at the national level. Is that what we're um, making sure that f folks were aware of? Yes, that is correct. Okay. We'll be m moving forward with that, exactly. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. All right, I'm going to open it up to committee members to see if you had questions. Uh, President Reynolds. Thank you. Um, question on uh, revenue models. So you said that revenues are difficult to um, estimate for a project of this size. Um, but I was just wondering, uh, and maybe this is also a question for the previous panelists, is um, what kinds of models are you looking at? They would obviously be smaller scale, um, but for types of revenues and revenues that have been used for other systems to make them self-sustaining. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure that it's fair to compare uh, other systems to the state of California because it, it's California's uh, infrastructure is so unique. But um, the elements of SB 156 allowing open access means that it, you know, carriers may be pursuing 10,000 miles of fiber for their own network. So that's one area where we would, where the state of California would be entering into an IRU agreement for subleaser for commercial purposes. And I, and, and I know for a fact that CDT has encouraged that in their conversations as they move forward with, for example, these joint build uh, uh, discussions. They've also been engaged in, you know, well, if you want infrastructure in any other part of the state, you know, that's an opportunity to build on those relationships that are already established. So carriers are interested in always evolving their business model. Um, there's going to be um, carriers that are interested in serving communities 
that need to get across the state and interconnect in uh, telecommunication centers that are uh, housed within the state. But then there are uh, entities that want to get across the state. So they come maybe via a trans-Pacific connection and they want to pass through the state because that's their business model is to bring traffic across areas. Um, so it's going to be a it's going to be a mix. There will be uh, those carriers that are transiting in a middle mile fashion, so they'll leverage. And, and there's plenty of those who are always looking for alternative routes, diverse routes. And then there's going to be carriers that are serving communities. And so there's numerous ISPs, uh, wireless ISPs that uh, are, are driven by. Uh, community uh, connectivity, and that's in their business model across the state. So this is geared exactly towards serving those last mile entities. And then in addition to that, there's uh, community-driven infrastructure um, uh, that uh, can leverage the network and will be there to help them optimize their last mile interconnection so that they can better use it. So it's, it's a real mix uh, and a variety, and I think that, as uh, Ms. Hovis pointed out, it's necessary in order to create the state sustainability. Once you start closing off the network to any particular segment of the community, whether commercial or community-driven, then you weaken the opportunity for uh, strengthening the sustainability models. So, yeah. hopefully that answers your questions. I know when we do the market sounding, you'll probably get more details out of that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. President Reynolds. Any questions from any other panel members? <laughs> Supervisor yeah, Leho. Just um, very intriguing pr presentation um, for us um, to, to learn from uh, from other states. Uh, one, one aspect that I wanted to see if you could um, have, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on was just on the open access portion of, of the project. In other states, did, um, did we see increased competition from providers and more reasonable rates uh, for consumers. I know that's a key aspect of why we're, we, we wanted this to be open access, but uh, uh, any lessons learned there on how it's worked um, in, from, in other states? I, I'm sure Ms. Hovis would uh, like some comments, but I will tell you I personally have seen that, yes, uh, in, in recent uh, areas. I've seen carriers drop their rates uh, as much as 30 percent just because uh, public investment in infrastructure was made uh, in certain markets. So I've seen that uh, readily, but I'm sure Ms. Hovis has more specific examples. Thank you. I absolutely agree. I've seen um, exactly the same dynamic, and over a couple of decades where we have seen um, in remote markets where a small provider might have been paying a massive amount for very, very modest amounts of bandwidth coming over an old copper line that was 50 or 60 years old. They would now be receiving competitively priced services over fiber, um, and they could rededicate what they had been spending on middle mile capacity to investing in their network, providing better services to their customers, really building up their um, capabilities and their business. We've also seen that open access component um, catalyze the development of new public networks at the local level, small, hyper-local, um, publicly owned, nonprofit-owned networks, because it creates opportunity where it might not exist otherwise. As Mr. Hunsinger pointed out, CDT's design will create interconnection opportunities in thousands of places where they currently simply do not exist. And so what that means is that where there had previously been a substantial barrier to last mile deployment, even on a micro scale, that barrier is now substantially lifted. And where we've seen that happen in other states, it's just opened the door to new kinds of deployments, including those that are just not commercial because they're public or nonprofit. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I apologize, but yes. there's one other area, too. It, it's not, uh, it may not be uh, overtly realized, but the network is going to strengthen uh, some of those existing rural uh, infrastructure that, that uh, is so germane to rural local exchange carriers and really remote areas. So the point is that some of those existing networks are going to gain incremental access that's going to create diversity and resiliency, but it's also going to drive down their costs as well. So it's another area where reduction of uh, backhaul uh, to tele 
telecom centers is going to change the business models of uh, some existing networks, and it'll be there to leverage for uh, uh, new networks as well. So it's not just spurring um, uh, the creation of a new entity necessarily, but it's also uh, underwriting the business models of some existing infrastructure that exists today. Thank you. Very Great conversation amongst the committee and uh, with the experts at the dais. Any um, additional questions from members? All right, I see none. So thank you both for your presentation today. I'd like I know we're doing this uh, this moving of the chair, so I want to invite uh, Maria Ellis from CPUC up to the dais. Uh, to give a presentation on what all the great work that's happening at the last mile. Again, CPUC is we meet um, at least weekly, we always say, uh, sometimes more, and so we just always appreciate hearing uh, all the great work that they are doing at the local level. So, Maria. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for having us today to talk about some of our last mile work. I'm going to dive right in if we can move on to the next slide. So this slide is probably very familiar. We try to highlight it very regularly so that we could kind of showcase in a brief snapshot some of the um, aspects of the SB 156 last mile work that we have. Um, I'm going to take a moment here to uh, first start with technical assistance since I don't have another slide. Um, separate slide for this, I want to take a moment to talk about this technical assistance work here. Um, the uh, local agency technical assistance, uh, which was funded as part of the federal funding account under SB 156, is meant to help um, local governments and tribes um, develop feasibility studies, plans, te it's technical assistance, all, everything that it would need to develop a last mile program or a last mile service program. I wanted to give a quick update on um, what we've done in this last, uh, just recently. To date, out of this account that was $50 million set aside, including a $5 million uh, set aside for tribes, we have awarded 105 grants to local governments and tribes across the state um, to do this work. So of this 105, uh, that includes eight tribes, in 97 local agencies. I want to break that down just a little bit further. The 97 local agencies included 42 cities, 45 counties, seven joint power authorities, one local education agency, one municipal utility district, and one public utility district. And so I wanted to share that to say that, you know, this has been a really successful program. Clearly there was a lot of demand for it. Um, we actually, uh, next week, the Commission will consider one resolution to approve the last bits of remaining funding um, that is available in this program. And so with that if, that, if that is approved by the Commission, would exhaust all of the remaining funding for this program. Um, and while there may not be more a lot of funds available, there continues to be tribal technical assistance which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, but that program continues to be available for California tribes um, for similar kind of work. Um, loan loss reserve program is a financing tool, is a credit, credit enhancement tool, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit further. But I do want to highlight just a note here that um, given the budget situation, the, um, this program was originally envisioned under SB 156 for 750 million current total, and which is the current status, but it is proposed to be shifted to a $500 million program um, in the proposed budget. Under the federal funding account, I'm going to dive deeper into that one just in a moment, so, uh, but just note that that is our last mile program for uh, creating some of the complementary programs that our, our CDT partners are um, working on. And then lastly, our CSF program. And uh, this is unique in that, uh, just a refresher that this is unique because it is a surcharged uh, uh, funded program. So it is an annual program through 2032. And this fiscal year um, was budgeted 
$73 million for this fiscal year for investments, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what those investments um, have been so far. Next slide. So uh, the federal funding account, um, just as a refresher, um, this, again, is meant to fund wireline investments, uh, last mile investments that result in end user service. Um, we closed our application window on the 29th of September of 2023 and received 884 applications requesting over $4.6 billion. Of these 484 applications, uh, we, that, that was comprised of 63 distinct entities applying with 484 applications. And so I want to just quickly break that down as well. These applications um, of that 484, 397 were from ISPs or Internet Service Providers. Uh, 79 were from public utilities, nonprofits, cooperatives, joint powers authorities, and eight were from tribal nations. Uh, after we closed the application window, uh, we moved on to the objection process, which is required by federal law. Um, and the funding that we originally got for this uh, for, for this program. And uh, that process, uh, the, the objection period was from October through December, and we closed it on December 8, um, 18th. Um, now that, uh, so one note, as you might have seen uh, some things in the budget about some shifts in the proposed budget, I want to note here that uh, the total funding for the federal funding account remains intact, that the uh, total funding available for each county still remains along using the formula that the commission adopted in decision 220455. And so what that means is each county starts with $5 million as a set aside, and then on top of that is allocated based on their proportion of total unserved locations. Um, so now that we are through with the objection process, the commission is now taking, is able to start their whole, uh, continue their holistic review of these applications and also considering those objections as the part of the process. One note is that we did receive a roughly almost 900 objections to different kinds of uh, projects, but those are all part of the evaluation that CPUC does as we are considering um, it, how to move forward with applications. Next slide, thank you. Loan Loss Reserve Program. Uh, so the goal of this program is to support the financing for public entities, tribes, and affiliated nonprofits. Um, and so the point here is that this is more of a credit enhancement, and unlike all of our other programs at CPC, it is not um, a, a, a grant program, which is really unique and also something that we've never done before. It's something quite different. Um, and so uh, we're really thrilled to have this tool in our toolkit because we know that starting these kinds of networks is not, um, is not cheap, and we want to be able to provide these kinds of partners the support that they need in that endeavor. Uh, we're pleased to say and that in November the Commission adopted rules for this program, and, uh, and so we plan, um, you can find more information on our website, and these are all, since these slides are publicly available, um, these links will take you to places where you can find more information. But we're really excited to share that uh, from between Q1 and Q3 of 2024, we will, um, have open, we will open our first funding window and make our first award um, between Q1 and Q3. Um, so we're thrilled about this program and look forward to seeing what kind of um, uh, likely lots of demand equally as we have seen for all of our other programs. We will also be doing a, a series of engagement and education opportunities for entities that might be interested in applying for this program. So stay tuned as we will be making those public and making sure that folks know how to take uh, advantage of this. Next slide. California Advanced Services Fund. Um, and as a reminder, we have six programs total under the uh, umbrella of the California Advanced Services Fund. Right now I'm going to talk about four. I'm going to um, start by really sharing a little bit about what we've been up to and the most recent accomplishments uh, with this program. Uh, 
So under the adoption account, which is, a, again, more about digital literacy and um, helping folks understand how to engage with, these, with this technology in a meaningful way to do everything from telehealth to work to school and learning, um, and also do it in a safe way. We received 86 applications and have funded 84 of them. Um, to, and um, we have funded uh, 84 applications for just over $11 million. And I think, you know, while those numbers are, you know, important, I think the main thing that really is important for me is that these grants have provided over 12 um, trainings to over 12,000 participants in terms of digital learning. It has uh, provided broadband access for over 14,000 participants and also um, helped uh, get subscriptions, uh, internet subscriptions for over 30,000 participants. The public housing account uh, is, uh, is an account, um, the purpose of that account is to help provide um, uh, inline, wireline, inside the building, usually access um, and free access as well to um, communities, low income community developments, including farm, uh, farm worker housing. Uh, You'll see here that we have six awards for um, just under half a million, um, five under, pardon me, six awards for just uh, a little under 500 million, and that has helped support over 360, uh, 306 um, households, living units, and also provided free internet for those uh, households for the duration of the program, which is statutorily five years. Infrastructure grant account. Um, so we, in June 1st, we received uh, 73 applications totaling $527 million, which is far above of the total um, allocation for this entire suite of programs. Um, we are making our way through those, uh, those applications and are trying to really coordinate and understand how that plays into our FFA applications. Um, we just did award one program already uh, one uh, project already for just under $700,000 to ANZA, and that's to provide um, 10 gigabit symmetrical speeds to rural communities in Riverside County. Tribal technical assistance, uh, we, uh, as you see here, we've already awarded one project for just uh, uh, five projects, excuse me, for a little over 700000 and we continue to see great interest in this program as tribes are um, you know, seeking to develop their own networks and meet the unique needs of their communities. Next slide. So on to, to the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program known as BEAD. Um, you know, uh, actually I'm going to move on to the next slide because I think this is a good little, uh, good summary here. We, this is also a familiar slide uh, that shows everything we've been, not everything, but a high-level summary we've been up to since, since 2023 um, and what's coming into 2025. In June, we received word from NTIA that we would receive $1.86 billion. The state would receive $1.86 billion to um, deploy this program. Um, and we're happy to say that on December 27th, uh, we submitted the state's uh, initial proposal which is a requirement of the NTIA program that outlines um, how, both how we plan on doing the challenge process for this program and how we hope to do subject selection. The initial proposal is, is um, split into two, into two volumes, and, uh, volume one and volume two, and that is important because that is how NTIA will plan on reviewing uh, the proposals. Um, we, the state has to receive approval from NTIA on both each volume before it can fully implement the program. And again, it will, that review and that approval will come sequentially. So um, I'm mentioning that because the next big, mile, next big milestone is expected. We're, if we had a crystal ball, we would guess sometime in February maybe um, for uh, approval of volume one. And what that means is that we could, uh, uh, after the commission takes action on that volume, we could um, start our challenge process. Um, after approval of volume two, which again, it's crystal ball, we could think maybe May, um, 
that would start the clock for this 365-day period for which the state must conduct a full subgrantee selection process um, and develop uh, the final proposal, which includes a list of all the proposed subgrantees. Um, and that needs to be delivered to NTIA, again, within 365 days of approval of Volume 2 which we anticipate will likely be, again, we'll be submitting that in uh, early 2025. That is really the bulk of the updates. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Ellis. That's a wonderful update on all, everything that's going on <clears throat> in your grant program, and I'd like to open it up to any of the members to make comments or quite ask questions. Oh, I see Assemblymember Berner. Hello, sorry for jumping in. I will have to jump off. I'm at several events here in San Diego. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I want to double check and see if um, you have the numbers of how many of the FFA applications have proposed to connect to the middle mile. Uh, thank you for that question, Assembly Member Berner. Um, we are in that process of evaluating. Um, we do we have some inkling in some of that, what is publicly available. Um, online, and some applicants have already stated that in their public applications. But we are doing an assessment uh, currently in a di deeper dive, more comprehensive dive, now that we have the objection information, to work with applicants to understand their plans a little bit better. We know that the objection process, the objections could change some projects um, and how they plan on connecting. It could change the feasibility or it could change, or it, uh, um, not feasibility, but it could just change their engineering as well. So. I think we'll have to get through that process of full evaluation and working with the applicants to have a better, a more hard number for how many of those will connect. Do you have a rough number? Like, a, it doesn't have, I mean, you've, you've reviewed their application, so you know if they're saying they're connecting the middle mile or not. That's probably something that's quite clear. Um, so do you have a rough number even before that uh, review period? Looking at what is publicly available right now, we see we do see that there are several applications that are planning to connect to the middle mile, um, specifically with those using joint powers authorities, public entities, and a lot of tribes are very reliant on the middle mile that is being proposed. So roughly how many applicants do you have? And when you say several, do you mean less than 10? No, no. It would be more, but I, need, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it also... Um, one thing uh, we are working through is that, again, the objection process may change people's uh, plans and their engineering. And so as we get, we, we know that those are currently big users and proposed users of the MMBI, but until, we don't have a definitive number until we can really work with those applicants to finalize their review of their application. So what is the approximate timeline by which we can probably uh, know when we would see that data? Uh, we hope to be able to provide an update by the next um, MM MMAC meeting. Okay, thank you. I think, you know, when we're going through and we're looking about our, our investments in the middle mile, we have to make yeah. sure that the return on investment that we're making on the on the backbone infrastructure is going to really pay off through FFA and BEAD and all the last mile funding. So I think that's a really critical thing for, for this, um, for us to consider when we're thinking about the middle mile. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Berner. Excellent point. Um, and we will keep everyone apprised as CPUC starts to uh, get through the challenge process. And I know there's many um, vendors that are their applications, and based on those ISPs, they, they may or may not connect to our network. And then the same thing with uh, last mile applicants on FFA. So we'll keep everyone apprised. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Any other questions or comments from anyone? All right, I don't see any, so we are moving on to public comment. Uh, Ms. Alvarado, if you please provide public comment guidelines uh, so that we can um, make sure that everyone has an opportunity to sh uh, share their uh, thoughts with us. Thank you. To ensure everyone who wishes to make public comment has the opportunity to do so, we respectfully request one person per entity and two minutes per person. The order of public comment will be in-person comments, Zoom and phone comments, 
and emailed comments submitted prior to the meeting. For in-person comments, please form a line at the podium. For Zoom, please use the raise hand feature in the lower toolbar. For phone, please press star nine to raise your hand. Emailed comments received prior to the meeting will be read at the end. We will start with the first person at the podium. Do I need to do anything? Okay. <laughs> Good morning, committee members and state partners. My name is Patrick Messick, and I'm here to support digital equity efforts in the City of Oakland. Thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment. Alongside digital equ equity advocates in marginalized communities across the state, Oakland extends our gr deepest gratitude to Assemblymember Bonta and the Legislative Black Caucus for their leadership to ensure this generational infrastructure investment doesn't yet again bypass historically redlined black and brown communities across the state. We'd also like to thank Governor Newsom for taking this critical step to include funding in this year's budget to actualize the promises made to communities that have been left behind by public and private investment for decades. The success of this transformational investment in bridging the digital divide hinges on the most important decision the state has yet to make, how to price the middle mile network in low revenue density communities. Building a network is great, but it will certainly be underutilized in the highest poverty, least connected communities if the pricing structure doesn't incentivize municipalities and innovative community-based providers to build out in neighborhoods where the margins are thin and return on investment requires patience beyond the next quarterly shareholder meeting. The most effective mechanism to expand access in these communities is CDT's unilateral authority to establish a differential pricing structure. In consultation with net network experts and legal counsel, we propose that CDT offer reduced rates based on the type of client and the location of the access point. First, location. We recommend differential pricing apply to communities that are either one, Cal EPA designated disadvantaged communities, or two, in the top two quartiles of the Socioeconomic Vulnerability Index, or SEVI, 50 to 100%. Next, type of client. Recognizing that municipalities and nonprofits prioritize people, not profit, both of these entities, entities should have free access to the network within priority communities with applicable strand caps. Additionally, community-based residential ISPs that offer a low-cost plan should be charged reduced rates or zeroed-out license fees for at least five years. In short, the price paid by multi-billion dollar corporations to access the network in Beverly Hills or Pleasanton cannot be the same as a nonprofit or municipality connecting public housing in East Oakland, rural Fresno, or tribal lands. The revenue generated from the network in California's wealthiest communities should be used to subsidize communities this network is intended to serve. The IRU on Oakland segment starts in fewer than six months, so we look forward to your ongoing partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Next public speaker, please. Great. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Georgia Savage, and I'm the Deputy Director of Oakland Undivided. Thank you for being here today. I want to echo Patrick's sentiments that we're incredibly excited at the governor's proposal, uh, proposed budget and that it includes an additional $1.5 billion for CD2 to complete the development of the statewide middle mile network. While the digital equity plan urges expediting the construction and development of the MMBI, given this new development, we strongly urge the state to utilize the remaining secured funding to instead prioritize connecting the lowest income, least connected communities that cannot afford to wait. We also wanna thank you for sharing the signed middle mile contracts with OU and other advocacy groups. This effort to increase transparency does not go unnoticed and it's appreciated. For several years, innovative providers have come to us with the goal of expanding access in Oakland's lowest income, least connected communities. However, they all shared that this was determined unfeasible from a budget perspective as backhaul in Oakland is shockingly five to 10 times as expensive as more competitive markets. These concerns were validated when we reviewed the contract that CDT signed with Bolden for Oakland's middle mile segments. Our segments are by far the most expensive per mile in the state, 
even twice as expensive as builds in comparable urban areas. This is especially concerning when factoring in duration of Oakland's lease, which could be as short as 15 years. So in the spirit of transparency, we look forward to continuing conversations about signed contracts and looking ahead, we encourage CDT to make the RFI squared proposals publicly available so we can help identify additional partners in our community, ensuring the best price possible and potentially use the proposals for future projects and collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. Now moving, any, any other comments in the room? Not seeing any, we will go to um, the Zoom. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Hi, it's Becky. Hello. I'm so sorry. I'm still having um, bandwidth issues, but I just, I, I actually have to sign off, but I think I wanted to make sure that you and your team know that the, the amount of work that has been done in the last few months is truly extraordinary. And the, the commitment to communities is remarkable. And I just could not be prouder of the state for, for all of the ways that not only the work we're doing and, and really arriving at this phase, but just the, the humility and professionalism and with which you and your teams are approaching it. It's, it's just such a incredible accomplishment to behold. So just wanted to express my gratitude for you and, and the entire team. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Moving to public comment, we have Maddie Ribble. Great. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, good morning or a good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to join you virtually today. My name is Maddie Ribble. I'm with the Children's Partnership. We are a statewide policy organization working to advance health equity and racial justice for California's kids. Today, I'm also representing the California Alliance for Digital Equity, or CADE, which is a statewide coalition of community advocacy organizations united in our conviction that digital equity must be considered a 21st century civil right. Uh, and I'll offer my support to uh, Patrick's comments earlier, who is a, a core partner of our CADE coalition. Um, today, I wanted to make three quick points. Uh, first, uh, from TCP and together with all of our CAID partners, we're extremely grateful to the governor for making good on his commitment to propose full funding for the MMBI in his January budget proposal. The inclusion of the $1.5 billion in proposed funding is a critical step toward reaching our collective goal of broadband for all. Um, however, as we all know, this is going to be a very challenging budget year, and not every worthy investment will be possible. Inclusion of these funds in the final budget agreement is not at all a foregone conclusion. Um, as the difficult deliberations on the budget begin, we want to urge each of you as Middle Mile Advisory Committee members to join us in using your voice to urge the legislature loudly to make this investment a top priority this year. And I want to say thank you in advance to all of the legislative partners who are part of the committee and on the call today. Uh, and thank you in advance for your continued leadership and support in this regard. Secondly, um, we wanted to state that equally important to the funding itself is prioritizing the spending of these funds first where they are needed most. And to do that, we must be clear about the details of the digital divide. There is abundant research that documents that it is income and race that are the best predictors of broadband access far and above any rural versus urban split. According to the uh, most recent USC and CETF survey, um, in cities and rural communities alike, Latinx residents lag behind white residents in connectivity by 10%, black residents lag behind white residents by 7%, and there's a 25% gap between Native American residents and white residents. Um, Low-income residents, 19% um, of low-income folks in California are unconnected, compared to only 4% of residents who are not low-income. It's crucial that we use these facts of the racial and income inequities to drive MMBI funds to the least connected communities in urban, rural, uh, urban communities, rural communities, and everything in between. Um, third and lastly, we want to continue to urge increased accountability and transparency in the MMBI. 
I want to say thank you to Mr. Monroe, Ms. Hernandez, and Ms. Liang uh, for the updates you shared today about efforts to improve stakeholder engagement and the new MMBI map log. Uh, it wasn't clear to me from today's presentation, but we want to urge you to include not only a log of future changes to the map, but also all previous versions of the map so that they are fully available to the public. Uh, we're hopeful that with the changes announced today, it will lead to lasting improvements in community access and partnership. And as always, all of us at the California Alliance for Digital Equity stand ready to work with you to ensure that every California resident has high quality, affordable broadband that they deserve. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Going to Assembly Member Wood. Yes, yes, thank you. And um, I, uh, I know this is the public comment time, so I won't take up a lot here, but um, I just want to say as a, as a member of the legislature, I am, I want to thank the governor for including, uh, continuing the support of broadband. I think it's a, it's critically important for California. And uh, it is one of the things that I plan to fight for as a legislator to make sure that that funding remains uh, in the budget. Uh, and I, I also, um, you know, I, I'm often, uh, I know I ask difficult questions, um, but I do that in the spirit of, of trying to get the very best possible outcome for my constituents and, and others in the state who have not historically had access to broadband. And I too uh, want to say that I am, I am impressed with the progress. I really am and encouraged to see uh, construction underway. Um, I, this feels like a snowball uh, rolling down a hill. Uh, and it's encouraging to see the increase activity and going forward. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'm in my last year in the legislature. Uh, I'm going to fight till the, bit, the bitter end to ensure that we get the funding uh, to move forward and these projects built. So thank you very much. Thank you, Assembly Member Wood. Moving to Larry Yee. We'll come back to Larry Yee. Moving to Linnea Jackson. Good afternoon. My name is Linnea Jackson. I'm the general manager with the Hoopa Valley Tribes Public Utilities. Uh, we are the point build partner um, with this state, and we are proud to be partnered uh, with GSN, CNT, our state partners in Caltrans. Um, I wanted to make a comment. Is so many of the things that were talked about today have impacted and benefited tribal nations. So we've received technical assistance. Um, we have funding under the local technical assistance grant. Um, those have been integral to um, tribal business. And it really is, um, I'm supportive of those functions. So when we talk about economic models, we need to make sure that we're carving out functions for tribal governments. We're not set up like your normal ISPs are or public and privately owned businesses. We have a sovereign government that is, and those considerations need to be made when you're thinking about sustainability and business functions that are eligible for tribal nations. Um, we look to continue to be strong partners for uh, the state of California and tribal nations as well. Um, we do appreciate the ongoing partnership and we're integral to the success of the investment that's been made and we look forward to continuing that partnership. So I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunities that are set aside for tribes. Um, I urge there to be continuing funding for such opportunities uh, so we can strengthen business development uh, for, to bridge the digital divide in our tribal nations and in our region. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Moving to Larry Yee. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for coming back to me. Your first time on here. Uh, I'm from San Francisco Chinatown community. And um, throughout the years, we've been having, um, I guess, dilapidated uh, infrastructure in, in San Francisco Chinatown impact the low, in, uh, low income community and let alone not the business. You know, coming out of the pandemic, we very much noticed that uh, access to the digital divide 
is very costly to our community. We hope that the ISP reach out to us in the Chinese uh, community in Chinatown. And throughout the whole state, we're in, in these small regions of small business and, and in the mission, uh, we're very much underserved. So I uh, hope there's additional funding out there for us. And please, uh, it's not just tribal, it's not just uh, the rural, it's also the inner city, small community that are sorely impacted by this digital divide. Um, it, it's like, uh, what, what can we say? What can we do? And what can you do for us? We are asking for help. And thank you very much. Thank you. There were no emails submitted prior to the start of MMAC at 10 a.m. today. Checking for any additional public comments. Seeing none, back to you, Director Bailey Crimmins. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to open it up to any committee members before we adjourn. Is there any last minute comments? A lot covered today. All right. No, I just wanted Supervisor to Lejo. yeah, just take a moment to uh, to acknowledge whatever you already said that the governor fulfilled his commitment. Um, we didn't have the the numbers yet, but when his when he released his proposal, um, and I know the 1.5 billion is spread out over the next two fiscal years, but nonetheless, the commitment is there, and I, I think I, I just wanted to, to commend that effort to make sure that we um, we we built out the full 10,000 miles as, as was promised to the people of California, and that, that will um, um, allow us to do it. But I, uh, it's easier said than done. Um, you know, the LAO had, had a, um, a deficit projected greater than what was in the governor's proposal, so there, is, um, there has to be a, uh, an effort to make sure that that money is in the budget when it's voted upon in June. So I look forward to also being a champion and making sure that that money remains there um, and, the, and that it has the legislative support for it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Any other comments? Director, we have a comment from SGV Progressives. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call after the session was already complete. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, my question had to do with, you know, if there is a problem with once the whole project is completed and we all have access, if there's a problem, you know, the service, who who would be responsible to address those concerns and questions? I believe the question was, if there is a problem with the service, the internet service once in place, who would be responsible for addressing that? So we don't, um, during public comment, uh, comment on, uh, respond to questions, but we will take that and um, be able to respond later. That operating model, what we were talking about earlier, is what we will be coming back with in April. So I um, just wanted to make sure Thank that Thank you, Director. That yes. concludes our public comment session. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you to the committee members, the presenters, the attendees. We had quite a few individuals online today, and it takes, we've talked about it, it takes a village. It takes all of us flocking arm to arm to address this uh, at the committee level, at the, at the ground level, at the grant and last mile level. Um, so again, thank you, everyone. And our next meeting is Friday, April 19th. 2024 between 10 and 11:30. You will also, if you are interested in participating in stakeholder engagement, as we were talking about earlier, between now and then, there will be outreach and available opportunities um, that's going to be uh, posted on our website. So, with that, I'd like to adjourn today's January 2024 meeting. Complete. Thank you. <laughs>